You know, normally in games like this, the mage or caster character is usually not all that fun to play, but in this game, the mage is actually one of the most fun characters in the game. Io is a mage-type character with a surprising amount of tech involved if you are playing her optimally between weaving casts between all of her actions and canceling animations early through dodging or rolling. And naturally, these more complex characters are the ones I naturally gravitate towards because, what can I say, I just like pressing a lot of buttons. In this video, I wanted to discuss Io, talk about her strengths and weaknesses, discuss general playstyle and setup, offer some tips, and showcase some practical use of the character in higher level content. If you enjoy guide content on this game or RPGs in general, please be sure to subscribe to the channel because I will be likely making a lot more guides on the game, including one on every single character. My description even has my Discord you can join or Twitter you can follow if you'd like to be notified when I release anything new. Let's get into it! So Io is a mage-type character who focuses on windows of higher burst damage, with much of her damage coming from her unique mechanic, Stargaze. Most of her kit is designed to take advantage of this move as much as possible. Stargaze, at its max potential, can do north of 2 million damage, but you cannot just spam this all the time, you have to build to it. How this works with Io is that every time she uses certain skills or does a charged normal attack, you will gain a Mystic Vortex Orb. When you have three Mystic Vortex Orbs, you will be able to fully charge Stargaze, which is bound to what is typically the combo finisher button, to release a huge area of effect attack that does massive damage. For Io in particular, this also means her regular attack is almost entirely useless, as you want to hold the button instead to charge it until her staff glows, as releasing the attack afterward will grant her a Mystic Vortex Orb. Her support skills also reinforce this idea further, with Enchanted suggesting that Stargaze is chargeable up to four times depending on the number of Mystic Vortex Orbs, with each charge adding a lot of additional damage to the previous one. I believe the amount gets doubled or slightly less than doubled for each level of charge, with level 1 Stargaze being an instant cast, level 2 being one bar fully filled up, all the way to Stargaze 5 with all four bars filled up. With no Mystic Vortex Orbs, you can only charge up to level 2, with each new orb allowing you to charge an additional level, meaning you want to build up your three orbs before unleashing a Stargaze 5 to do the most possible damage. Quick Cast, her other skill, also backs up this idea, where the charge speed of Mystic Vortex is greatly increased after gaining a Mystic Vortex Orb which is essentially the moment Io herself glows. You can use this after certain skills that grant an orb, after a link attack, which also grants an orb, and after her charge, normal attacks. On the surface, this might seem like her playstyle is fairly straightforward and simple, just building up orbs and unleashing massive damage after getting your third orb, and while playing like this is fine on a more basic level, if you want to truly maximize her potential, it gets a lot more complex than that. So remember what I said about how you're able to use Stargaze level 1 and 2 without any Mystic Vortex orbs? As it turns out, taking advantage of this is the key to maximizing your damage. So in the score attack run I showed off at the beginning of the video, you may have noticed that basically after every single Mystic Vortex Orb I obtained, I usually weaved in a level 2 Stargaze. This is taking advantage of Quick Cast to the fullest since using level 2 does not use up any Mystic Vortex Orbs and still adds a not insignificant amount of damage. The cast is also very quick and can be near instantly cancelled into your next move while the damage will still come out. This means you're still able to build up your three Mystic Vortex Orbs while weaving in these level 2 Stargaze casts after every orb you obtain, which is able to increase your DPS quite a bit. Especially because obtaining Mystic Vortex Orbs is going to be limited by either skill cooldowns or basic charged attacks, which don't do too much damage anyway. This means that playing optimally, you'll want to be using these level 2 Stargaze casts basically after everything you do that grants a Mystic Vortex Orb, since you'll get the Quick Cast bonus. This definitely takes some practice to get good at, but it's super satisfying when you're able to pull it off. Naturally, when you do reach 3 orbs, you'll want to fully charge a Stargaze 5 cast. The thing about Stargaze 5 is it actually has a bit of an animation on the cast that can't be immediately cancelled into a skill. So in order to cancel this, you'll either need a Link Attack activation or to dodge roll so you can use your next ability. This limits your downtime and allows you to use even more skills and get even more casts off. You can also take this a step further than even I was able to because of time limitations in the first section I showed you by weaving in level 1 Stargaze cast at certain points of your rotation since it is an instant cast. For the times you don't have a quick charge bonus like after one of these dodge rolls and before using a new skill, you can use a level 1 Stargaze to get a small bit of additional damage for canceling into your next cast. This can be a bit mechanically intensive when you combine all of these parts, especially on controller, but it really is super satisfying to pull off. You can also hold your charge of Stargaze, such as if you're at two Mystic Vortex Orbs and see a skill coming off cooldown that grants one. You're able to charge three levels, roll while keeping the charge if you don't release the charge button before rolling, then use your skill and continue the charge the rest of the way. This is useful in certain situations. 
And finally, after charging higher levels, you will gain Stout Heart and also be able to hold your charge at the maximum level if you wish, meaning you could sit there all day holding level 5 for when it's more convenient to hit a boss as long as you don't die beforehand. In fight cutscenes, unfortunately, it will be interrupted. That was a lot so far, so I'll save any additional gameplay tips for the practical showcase at the end of the video. Let's get into setup. So this is the setup I used for that score attack run. Naturally, I would not be recommending this for more casual play because it has no team support or defensive utility at all. It is primarily focused on doing as much damage as possible. Well, without having glass cannon equipped at least, which increases your damage cap another 30%. But regardless, this was a pretty nice setup for doing as much damage as I could during that section, but I would not recommend it for more general play. For more general play, this is what I would recommend instead. Now, I changed about three sigils here. One of them you can't tell I changed because it's just another damage cap 5 plus with a different substat that's more defensive in nature. But regardless, this is probably what I would do for a more general setup. Just replace the supplementary damages so I don't have as many. So I've got the Terminus weapon. This is going to be the most optimal weapon 99% of the time, probably 100% of the time even, just because of the fact that it has the Catastrophe bonus trait on it. We all know how good this trait is from previous videos if you have watched it. This basically gives you a free additional damage cap and a massive damage increase as well in the form of attack, as long as you are below 45,000 health, which is not too hard to do at all. Only the Terminus weapon has this, which is what makes it the best weapon overall, essentially. And if you max out the Awakening, you get Sigil Booster, which raises the trade of all of your Sigils by one level each, which makes you just ever so slightly stronger in pretty much every Sigil you have equipped. So definitely run the Terminus weapon if you have it. If you don't, the Crit Rate weapon or the Awakened weapon should work just fine. I also have Link Together. This has a Quick Cooldown as the additional bonus effect on it. This gives you maximum level of quick cooldown, which is one of the best skills on EO, just because you're able to use all of your skills more often. Link Together is just a very nice general effect that I really like running as well on pretty much everyone because it gives you more link level gain, which means more link time, and it also boosts the damage of Skybound Arts and Chain Burst, which are usually harder to cap. Improved Dodge here. This has the Guts bonus effect. This is two very useful defensive utility tools being able to uh, have a higher window for dodging attacks, which can be really nice for EO since you're able to dodge while keeping your charge. So when you're charging your attack, you're able to dodge more often and uh, keep your charge in more efficient manner. And Guts is just universally probably my favorite defensive utility tool. It allows you to survive any hit with one health, which is very, very nice. War Elemental is pretty much required on basically anyone you're trying to do a lot of damage with because it bypasses the damage cap and gives you a free 20% damage boost against most enemies in the game because you're always able to attack as the superior element, so definitely run this if you have it. Now for myself, my Overmastery bonuses are not the best. I only have a 4% crit rate total from Overmasteries, which is exactly enough to hit 100%, funnily enough, because otherwise I have 96% crit with the uh, two crit rate 5 pluses I'm running. But I'm running a crit rate 5 plus here because I want to hit that 100% critical hit rate mark, which is very useful. This one has the stamina bonus trait. The higher your health is by percentage, the higher your damage is going to be. This is one of the best damage boosters in the entire game and is going to be one of the ways we ensure we're hitting damage caps as much as we can. Mage's Savvy will boost Stargaze's damage cap when Quick Cast is triggered. This also makes Quick Cast even more important because you'll get a damage boost every time you trigger it. This also makes your Stargaze level 2s that are triggered after Quick Cast hit harder as well, which increases the overall damage of her rotation. This has the Tyranny bonus effect attached to it. Now, if you have something better than this that can increase damage like Concentrated Fire, which is pretty good on EO because basically everything she does is ranged, then that would probably be the better option here just to ensure you have a bit more safety in the form of maximum health if you aren't running an Aegis, which I have not had the room to fit on this current setup. But regardless, Tyranny is still a really nice attack boost. It just uh, lowers your maximum health, which can be a little bit annoying. The total value of Mage's Savvy is a damage cap 50% increase, so it is definitely not insignificant. It's very much worth running. And Tyranny is a nice 30%, 36% attack boost as well, which is really nice. And then we have the obligatory 4 damage cap 5 pluses to ensure that we are hitting basically everything that we need as far as damage cap. We're getting the maximum value of damage cap out of this. Uh, I have Cascade on one of these. This seems to work better on EO than some of the other characters I have used because it does increase the uh, effect of her cooldowns a lot as long as you are hitting the... Uh, enemies with the right attacks. So Cascade works a little bit better on her. You get more skill cooldown by using Cascade. It's really good because of that. Two of these have quick cooldown on them as well, so we can hit the maximum for quick cooldown and get that 20% skill cooldown. Very nice to have. The more skills you use, the more uh, Stargaze cast you get off and the more damage you're going to deal overall. And then finally, the last one has Potion Hoarder. This is the damage cap I replaced before. 
The defensive utility of Potion Hoarder is pretty much unmatched. I pretty much recommend running this on anyone. You get three revived potions. You get a lot of other potions in general. It's just really, really good for overall safety and just everything. So, and it also helps a lot if you just want to kind of tank through everything with uh, holding your Stargaze cast because you're able to restore your health while sitting there in Stout Heart while waiting to cast your level 5 Stargaze. So that's really nice as well. My other critical hit rate 5 plus has Quick Charge on it. Quick Charge is an incredibly useful ability on EO because it allows you to charge your Stargazes even faster. Now, this is not entirely 30% faster like the uh, trait details would have you believe here, simply because there is a bit of a delay between levels of Stargaze cast where it'll pause for a fraction of a second before charging the next level. But regardless, it is still very, very beneficial for her, and it also increases the damage of your charge attack, so your Stargaze casts by 20%, which is really nice. Supplementary damage is the other effect I have here. With just one of these, you still reach 42% supplementary damage, which is really nice as a trait detail. Now, if you want to run all three and just be really all in on offensive and just be a super gamer who doesn't take any damage because you're able to dodge everything, then be my guest. Go ahead and run three of these. You'll get the full damage benefit from it, and it'll be really nice. But still, having 42% just from running one of these is still a really nice damage increase, so that is very nice as well. And finally, we have Mage's Aspiration, the Shortened Stargaze's cast time. A really, really useful sigil to have as well, because it's a 30% faster charge speed, essentially, so definitely run this as well. And the reason I have these on separate traits instead of just running the Awakening is because it gives me the ability to run an extra orange trait, since I'm able to include an orange trait on both of these, which normally would not be possible otherwise. And then Quick Charge, uh, the last Quick Charge is the bonus effect on this one as well, so I have two pretty good effects on these two uh, unique sigils, which is really nice to have. So the imbued traits are critical hit rate 10. This lets me hit that 100% crit rate benchmark and also cascade level 5, which gives me the full value of cascade, assuming it actually works properly, which I believe it does most of the time on EO. So I'm able to get that full arc cooldown from that as well, which is really nice to have. Let's talk about her skills now. So EO has actually a lot of useful skills depending on the situation. The general skill setup is going to be the four skills that you see here. We have Freeze. This is one of her very quick cooldown spells that grants a Mystic Orb when it is used. It also applies a pretty minor attack down debuff, which can be pretty nice just to ensure that the rest of your team is not taking as much damage, and you're not as well if you do end up getting hit. Very, very good just for the short cooldown alone. I absolutely recommend running this pretty much at all times. Flowery 7. This is one of your big burst spells. It does not have the ability to give you a Mystic Orb like her other damage abilities, but it's still very much worth running just because of how much damage it does. You do not have to hold this to get the full amount of damage if you are maxed out on damage because you will still hit the cap anyway, so you can just kind of tap it and still get the full value of the damage. It's really nice to have in a general burst spell, just in general. Fire is a really good ability. This lowers the defense of the enemy, so if you're not quite hitting caps, this can help you get to that level. And it is also very, very quick cooldown, just like Freeze. So this, this un in coordination with Freeze is one of your best bets to build up your Mystic Ores fast. Definitely recommend running this at all times. And then we have a Mystic Vortex. This will instantly max out your Vortex Orb, so this is really good to use after casting a full Stargaze 5 because you're able to instantly get to your Stargaze 5 again and use this. Now, in the uh, score attack run, I did not use this because using the uh, Gravity ability, Gravity Well, does give you more damage overall if the enemy stays inside the Gravity Well, but naturally they're probably going to move away if it's an actual enemy and not a dummy. But this can be a really good ability if you are in a fight where the enemy stays stationary for long periods of time because it does do a lot of damage over time if you're able to get the full value of the damage. And you also gain a Mystic Vortex Orb from it, so it is nice because of that. The other abilities we have are Healing Winds. I don't really recommend running this because most teams are probably going to have Potion Hoarders on basically everyone, and most really good teams are not even going to get hit that much at all, so you don't really need a healing ability like this, especially on a caster like EO. Especially because it doesn't allow you to get Mystic Vortex Orbs, and we want to get those to do as much damage as we can. Lightning is very situationally useful depending on the fight you are in. Paralysis is actually really nice. You're able to just kind of stun enemies for a period of time. You can uh, delay some of their ultimate attacks during uh, overdrive periods, which can be really nice. It is on a pretty long cooldown, but you do gain a Mystic Vortex Orb on cast. This is really very fight dependent and strategy dependent depending on what team you are on and what fight you are against, so... Just kind of situationally consider bringing this maybe over Flowery 7 or uh, Mystic Vortex, depending on the fight. And then finally, we have Concentration. This move, unfortunately, kind of sucks. It does grant Stout Heart, but you kind of gain Stout Heart from charging up anyway if you uh, cast it from Quick Cast. And it boosts the charge speed of Stargaze, but this charge speed does not uh, stack with the Quick Cast boost. 
it is just kind of the same speed regardless based on that. So you're just kind of, the only benefit you get out of this is if you somehow miss a quick cast, but you're likely never going to miss a quick cast if you are good at the character. So uh, this is just a really, really useless skill. I do not recommend writing this at all. And then finally, let's talk about masteries. So obviously you're going to want to max out your offense and defense trees and your collection when you can because you get a lot of useful effects out of collection, especially your terminus weapon, which gives uh, cap ups. Your overmasteries. This is the important thing here. So we have skill damage cap up, normal attack cap up for myself. These are almost maxed out, but not quite. Skill damage cap up is only at 16%, unfortunately, so I do miss a little bit of damage there. And I have critical hit rate up 4%. That's honestly the main reason I decided to keep this instead of rolling for something a little bit better because that lets me hit exactly 100% with the uh, the other crit rate that I have on everything else. And I was like, all right, I'll just keep this because I think uh, normal attack damage cap up, this is the most important thing you can have on EO because this is what Stargaze is considered. It's considered a normal attack instead of a skill. And the skill damage is your secondary source of damage, so that's still going to be the second most important thing. Critical hit rate's probably third. Other things you might want to look for are Skybound Art damage cap up and maybe skill damage ups that some of the skills can be a little hard to get hit cap on and maybe attack up even. So there's a couple different options here, but normal attack cap up is the most important and skill damage cap up is the second most important. So just be look on the lookout for those. So once again, that was a lot of information. Let's get into the more practical part of the video. Here is a very brief spoiler warning on end game raids. I'm not sure what's considered spoilers for people who played the mobile game, but I will be showing off some late game raids here. So just be aware of that. So the video is already pretty long as is, so I'm only going to show off one fight here. I think this fight is a pretty good example of things to do and also things not to do, since there are definitely aspects of this that could be improved if I uh, changed how I did things or did some of my rotations a little bit better. Like right there, for instance, I accidentally canceled one of my uh, spell casts on the link time so I don't get the full level 4 there. I have to use the uh, fire there in order to get my Stargaze level 5 and uh, roll out of the uh, cancel there in order to do that. So don't cancel your link time early. The link time attack with EO comes out a little bit later. That is something to keep in mind. Um, otherwise, I'm just trying to weave in my uh, level 2 cast when I can. I'm also just going to handle some of the crystals around the field, since sometimes your allies will not do that. Since link time's almost back up, I do want to get close enough to uh, activate that. I cast a quick level uh, 2 Stargaze, and then I go focus on another crystal again, since I can target them from across the field. Just using Stargaze level 1 can be pretty beneficial on these, since... Uh, you can just target them from across the field, so you don't really have to worry too much about uh, anything as far as going up close to them or anything like that. Now, for this fight in particular, and in a lot of fights, when they have an enraged mode to start using a special attack, they will take reduced damage by about, like, only about 25-30% to 30 of the normal damage they would take. So that's something to keep in mind. You may want to hold your big cooldowns when that happens, because in this fight, there were a couple times I did not hold my cooldowns, and I end up getting drastically less damage on my Stargaze level 5s, which is not something you want to happen, typically. I would say for this character, there isn't any kind of flowchart rotation since a lot of it's just kind of playing by ear based on what your current uh, cooldowns are. So based on what your cooldowns are, you can kind of just kind of figure out what to do. Like I almost have fire off cooldown here, so I'd end up holding my charge here and using a Stargaze level 5 in this situation. Now it was close enough to not being off cooldown. I probably could have fit another Stargaze level 2 there and uh, then charged up to Stargaze 5 afterwards and that probably would have given me more damage overall. And in this section, I am poorly trying to dodge and getting hit because of it, so I need to improve my play on this boss fight in particular, especially when I'm kind of focusing on caster mechanics here. So this is a good example of when you can release your Stargaze a little bit too early. You can see I got drastically reduced damage on my Stargaze there right before the break went off, so if I would have held on to it just a little bit longer until that phase fully ended, I would have gotten a lot more benefit out of it. Otherwise, I'm just charging up my level 4 Stargaze again. If you do get a Link Attack at a bad time, like when you're trying to charge a level 5 Stargaze or something like that, you might just want a Link Attack in general because Link Attack is always going to be really beneficial to the team. So uh, I would prioritize that over Stargaze level 5 most of the time. So now we're just kind of using our special moves to keep the uh, boss stunned a little bit longer. Uh, I tried to get in range in time. That was the other EO that used their special before. I'm just a little bit too far out of range. So that's something that you might want to uh, fix in the future. I would like to say it was intentional since uh, you can keep the boss stunned a little bit longer with these two burst chains instead, but it was definitely uh, not intentional there. Hopefully you've also been able to see in this fight that I'm using the Mystic Vortex skill when I do not have any uh, orbs. That allows me to get uh, the most benefit out of my cooldowns there because I'm able to do another Stargaze level 5 afterwards when I do that. And in this section, because uh, we're able to kind of keep him stun locked here, he doesn't actually trigger the next phase of the fight until 19%, normally he triggered at 50% health. 
Although it does make the rest of the fight a little bit more dicey just because he's going to be able to use a lot of special moves at back to back. So that's something that I'm going to be watching out for here. In this particular fight, I do have an Aegis equipped because I have 42,000 max HP, which is probably nice for the safety. And also to make sure that the Stout Heart buff allows me to immune damage a little bit more and keep my charge more if I'm going to try to immune through, immune through things. So in this section, from what I can tell, the more of these orbs that are still up, the more dangerous his attack is going to be. So I end up just trying to go around and destroy many of the orbs as possible while trying to hold on to my Stargaze level 5 charge. So I want to keep that to do damage to the boss. I also end up taking damage while just trying to focus on the orbs more in general there. What I end up doing is uh, targeting the uh, adds, I believe, because I know it's going to do reduce damage to the boss itself, and I'm like, okay, there's going to be a lot of downtime here, so I might as well just release one of these, since there are a lot of adds. I end up holding it for a little bit, but then I roll out of the way of that attack. I'm able to keep the full charge, because I make sure I'm able to do that. When that attack goes off, I make sure to dodge it, and then I try to release my attack after that. I do get the reduced damage on the uh, Star Gaze level 5, unfortunately, even still. Sometimes it can be really beneficial to dodge an attack and then release your Stargaze level 5 like I did there, just in general, though. And here I try to uh, stout heart through the damage. I end up releasing one of my uh, Stargaze charges a little early on that, unfortunately, because I wanted to be safe and make sure that I didn't get targeted by anything. And once again, he's kind of just still immuning a lot of this, but I'm going to just hold my ability, take some damage intentionally there, try to get my invincibility from uh, dodging an attack. And all the while during this phase, he's still taking reduced damage. Like, that was a really bad use of Flowery 7 there, because he just took massively reduced damage. I had no reason to use the cooldown there, especially because it's a long cooldown. I should have absolutely waited there. So I hold on to my level 5 cooldown here, and I actually wait properly until uh, he's done with his damage reduction phase. So I'm actually able to get the full amount of damage here. We finally trigger Link Time when he has 5% left. I haven't actually talked about Link Time with Eo, but essentially you have full Mystic Vortex Orbs the entire time, so the... Optimal rotation, unless you're just trying to kill the enemy quickly, is just fire into level 5 Stargaze every single time while Link Time is active. You'll get the most damage and benefit out of it just doing it that way. So, that's how you would probably approach Link Time with EO. Overall, though, there are a lot of things you can do to improve your damage with the character, and knowing when to use Stargaze, when to hold on to your cooldowns, and when to weave in your spells is going to be the most important thing to kind of understanding and playing the character optimally. I think that is going to cover it for this video. I do hope you guys have learned something from watching and have learned how to play the character at least a little bit better. Once again, I am open to feedback, so let me know how you can I can improve these guides in the future in the comments below. And if you did enjoy the video, please be sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and please look forward to all of my future content on Relink. I want to make one of these guides for every single character, and I will be putting in the time to make sure I kind of understand the characters on a fundamental level before releasing guides, because I don't want to half-ass it if I can. So, once again, thank you guys so much for watching. Please look forward to future content. And have a wonderful and blessed day.